Welcome to GDs, and this is, Perry Mason, Season 1. Season starts, with Emily and Matthew Dodson, paying a ransom, in order to get their son Charlie, back from his abductors. As they leave the money, and go to get their son, they learn, that he has passed away, and his eyes were sued open. On the other hand, we get to see Perry Mason, a private investigator, and a World War veteran, working with a friend Pete Strickland, as they are following and keeping an eye on an actor. Later, they were able to get compromising photos of him, for which they were hired. We also get to see Mason, living on his parental farm, which is beside an airfield, and he is refusing to sell it to Lupe Gibbs, the owner of the airfield, as she wants to expand the runway, in spite of him having an intimate relationship with her. Mason is asked by E.B. Jonathan, an attorney and a regular employer of him, to help him with a case, as he is being hired by Herman Baggerly, a rich and powerful industrialist. As Mason goes with him to meet with Baggerly, he learns, that the case that he needs to work on, is that of Charlie's kidnapping. Baggerly, doesn't trust the Los Angeles Police Department, to do the job that was needed. He also lets them know, that the Dodson, are not rich, but they are the members of his church, Radiant Assembly of God, and that is why he is helping them out. Mason and Jonathan, reach Dodson's house. Matthew Dodson, is being interrogated by Detective Holcomb and Ennis. They learn from him and his wife, that when Charlie was abducted, he was at the grocery store, while his wife was sleeping downstairs, after putting Charlie to bed. The detectives with their line of questioning, seem to be suspicious of Matthew, for being involved in the kidnapping. Mason also thinks, that something is not adding up, as the kidnappers knew, that Dodson's, will be able to pay a $100,000 ransom. Mason, investigating the case, learns from a traffic cop, that right before Charlie was found, he saw a green Phaeton, getting away fast. He shares this information with the detectives, who seem to be convinced, that Matthew Dodson, was involved in Charlie's abduction. He later goes to see Charlie's body in the morgue, and keeps a part of the thread with him, which was used to sue his eyes. Later we see him, going to a New Year's party, and he tries to leverage a better pay for the photos he took, but it turned out, that he overplayed his hand, resulting in him not only losing the promised amount, but also getting a beatdown in return. As he returns home, we learn, that he is separated from his wife Linda, and gets even more upset, as he is not able to talk with his son. On the other hand, we see Detective Ennis, visiting Charlie's kidnappers. He shoots and kills two of them in the apartment, while the third, being shot, is able to make it to the roof, and as he tries to get away, he falls and dies. While Baggerly, plans to lay Charlie to rest, with the funeral services at the church. And Sister Alice, shows Dodson's her support, in their time of grief. Later, Detectives Holcomb, and Ennis, in the presence of District Attorney Maynard Barnes, arrest Matthew, for conspiring to commit Charlie's kidnapping. As they were able to determine, that he lied about being at the grocery store. In addition, they claimed to have an eyewitness, who saw a figure like him, coming out of his house, carrying a child, on the night when Charlie was abducted. And finally, they were able to figure out, that he was able to get the money to pay for the ransom, as he is Herman Baggerly's son. Knowing this, Mason, is even more suspicious of Baggerly, as he withheld information from them. While Baggerly, is also not fond of him, knowing, that he got a blue ticket discharge from the military. We learn in a flashback, that during the war, as Mason's company retreated because of a gas attack, he killed mortally wounded soldiers, rather than leaving them, to face a painful death, from the gas. Meanwhile, Officer Paul Drake, finds the bodies of two of the kidnappers who were killed. He also follows a blood trail of a third person to the building's roof, but he finds no body. As he writes his report, he is questioned by Detective Holcomb and Ennis. They put pressure on him, to revise his report, in order to fit their narrative, that the blood trail, was not going out of the apartment, but instead, was coming in. Drake changes his report, but is not comfortable with the same. And as he looks further, he is able to find a broken denture at the scene. Mason, is able to convince Strickland to help him investigate the case, despite not being able to pay him for the last case. He also goes back to Dodson's house to know more, it is when he learns from their neighbor, that she has seen Emily, to be on the phone for long periods of time. Knowing this, Mason, decides to follow Emily, as she is helped by Della Street, secretary of Jonathan, who is helping her to prepare for Charlie's funeral. Following them, Mason, was able to find the number which Emily has been calling. He learns, that the phone belonged to George Gannon. Mason, 
in order to know more, visits his home. Being there, he finds Gannon dead, with a suicide note, where he confesses to killing Charlie and the others, and the remains of burned ransom money. In addition, he also finds love letters, written to him by Emily. Mason, takes those letters, and goes to Jonathan, and tells him what he found. He now believes, that it might be her, who is responsible for Charlie's abduction. But Della, spending the day with her, is sure, that she is not responsible. She lets them know, that infidelity is not murder. Jonathan, having this information. In addition, being able to confirm, that Matthew, was at a gambling game when Charlie was being abducted, knew, that he could get him out. At Charlie's funeral, Sister Alice, gives an emotional sermon. But before they could lay Charlie to rest, Emily, is publicly arrested. Jonathan, is confident, that he will be able to get Emily acquitted. Before the trial starts, D.A. Maynard Barnes, shows the media, the letters which Emily wrote to Gannon, providing it as a proof, that she was involved in Charlie's abduction. Jonathan, lets Emily and Matthew know, that they have to appear to be together in the court, so that the jury can see a husband supporting his wife. But Matthew, learning that she had an affair, is also quite upset with her, and blames her for Charlie's abduction. Although at the trial, he sits behind Emily, to support her. Barnes, hammers her with accusations during the bail hearing. Emily, feeling responsible for not being able to protect Charlie when he was taken from their home, nearly pleaded guilty. But Jonathan, is able to push through, and Emily, pleads not guilty. Barnes requests a $25,000 bail, which the judge accepts. Della, seeing Barnes, go after Emily character so viciously, blames Mason for the same, as he could have got Matthew off, without implicating Emily. Mason, investigating further, gets to know, that Gannon, was an accountant at the Church of Radiant Assembly. Being there he learns, that Gannon, had worked on a few of their fundraisers, and they give Mason, the references that Gannon had. Mason asks Strickland, to look into Gannon's references, as he follows up on the police report of Officer Drake. Mason, finding the report unsatisfactory, tries to talk with Officer Drake, but he refuses to comment on it. Later, we see Detective Ennis, strongly suggesting to Officer Drake, to keep his mouth shut. While Strickland, was able to find, that Gannon, used to work at a casino. Hoping to find more at the casino, Mason goes there, but he learns from Gannon's former boss Al Howard, that Gannon left voluntarily from there, for religious reasons. Mason along with Strickland, visits Coroner Virgil Sheets, in order to know more about the kidnappers. They learn from Sheets, that one of the men, who was found dead, did not die of the gunshot, but because of a boot on his neck. While Gannon's body, was sent to another morgue, where his cause of death was determined to be a gunshot, to his head, and had nothing more in the report. Mason, seeing the evidence, has a strong feeling, that Gannon is being set up. Thus he tries to talk with Drake again. Drake, punches him, and asks him to stay away. But feeling guilty, he later goes to him unofficially, and tells him, that he was asked by Detective Holcomb, to change his report. He also gives him the denture he found. But lets him know, that if he ever asks him anything officially, he will deny it. Mason and Strickland, having the denture, sneak into the morgue, and are able to confirm, that the dentures belong to Gannon. Meanwhile Baggerly, believing that Emily is indeed guilty, stops funding Jonathan and his team. On the other hand, Sister Alice, believing in Emily, visits her, in order to give her strength. And as they talk, Emily tells Sister Alice, that she feels guilty about Charlie's death. But Sister Alice is able to make her see, that she is not responsible. Later, as Della goes to visit Emily, she finds, Ennis and Holcomb, attempting to violently get a confession out of Emily. She is able to stop them, while Jonathan, is able to get her into protective custody. Mason and Strickland, steal Gannon's body, and they ask Virgil, to examine the body. Virgil tells them, that the body has a broken hip and a gunshot wound in the shoulder. Thus this proves, that he couldn't have driven back, after killing the other two men, as being claimed by the detectives. And they now believe, that there is a fourth man, who is also involved, and tried to cover up everything. And in order to have an official autopsy, they dumped the body at a golf course, so that it could get to Virgil's morgue, officially. They tell Jonathan about their theory, but having no admissible proof, it's just a theory. Jonathan, in order to get Emily Bale, tries to raise the capital on his own, but he is unsuccessful. He then goes to the DA, and tells him about his theory of there being a fourth man. 
but the DA, using this case to prop himself up, for the upcoming mayor's election, threatens Jonathan, and tells him, that he only has three options, either he pleads Emily out, tanks the case at trial, or face charges of misappropriating client funds, which will get him disbarred. On the other hand, Sister Alice, preaching to her followers, suffers a sudden seizure during one of her performances, and as she recovered, she claimed, that God told her to resurrect Charlie. Her claims, divided the church. Baggerly and the other bankrollers of the church, want her to issue a retraction after her statement. Sister Alice, being convinced by her mother, is ready to give a retraction to the newspapers. But as she begins, one of her congregation members, shows her support for what she claimed. And Sister Alice, instead of retracting, doubles down on her vision, and tells everyone, that Emily is innocent, and she will resurrect Charlie. This outburst, leads to a division in church, where many high-profile donors, decided to leave the church. While Mason and Strickland, retracing the steps of the kidnappers, discover, that the building they used for the ransom location, connects to a lodge, and Ennis being a member of a social club, is present at that lodge. While Jonathan, shaken by Barnes, goes to Emily, in order to make her plead guilty, but he has a change of heart in between, and he urges her to fight. However, the next day, Jonathan, not being able to get a loan to get his client out, and being threatened by the DA with disbarment, is quite disheartened, and feels defeated, thus, he decides to end his life. Della, finds Jonathan's body and calls Mason. They cover up his suicide, as a natural death. Later, they return his body, to the family plot in Northern California. It is when they find, that Jonathan had been long estranged from the rest of his family. Mason, being there, also goes to visit his son Theodore. Though his ex-wife Linda, denies Mason's request, to have their son temporarily live with him. She allows him to spend some time with him. Meanwhile, Strickland learns, that Ennis, was the first detective to reach at two of the crime scenes, while he paid off the division chief, in order to head Charlie's case. Later on tailing Ennis, he finds him visiting a Chinatown brothel. Ennis, was able to spot Strickland. He shares his suspicions with him. Ennis, attempts to shift the blame to his partner Holcomb, but his defense only increased Strickland's suspicions of him. He shares what he found with Mason. Despite being told by Mason, he won't be able to pay him, Strickland agrees to continue to work on the case. On the other hand, after Sister Alice's outburst, a lot of high rollers abandoned them. But Alice got support from a lot of others. Thus she was able to convince her skeptical mother, to use church funds to post Emily's bail, and let her serve as her guardian. She assures her, that when she will return to the mic, they will get even more support. Emily, is finally bailed out, and she finds a support in Sister Alice. Her new court-appointed lawyer, is not competent attorney, and later Della, was also able to discover, that he was working with D.A. Barnes. Della, tries to get her a good attorney, but none were willing to take her case. As Mason's rage at the legal system, Della, seeing him speak, forges a document, stating, that Mason had been serving a legal apprenticeship under E.B. Jonathan, and thus can represent Emily. Emily, accepts Mason to represent her in the trial. And with help from Deputy District Attorney, Hamilton Berger, who is friendly with Della, Mason, was able to pass the bar exam, and he becomes a lawyer. The trial gets off to a poor start, when Mason struggled to deliver his opening arguments. While Barnes, calls in a surprise witness, a hotel manager, who testifies, that he saw Charlie being left alone in a room, as Gannon and Emily made out in an adjoining room. And Barnes uses it to show, how careless Emily was for her son. While Strickland, uncovers some checks, which suggests that Gannon was stealing from the church. He tells Mason to use Gannon's dentures in court, but Mason is apprehensive about betraying Drake. Strickland, also travels to Colorado, to follow up on a lead on Ennis, and two of the kidnappers. Being in Colorado he finds, that Ennis worked there for a church deacon, Eric Seidel, years prior, along with the other two kidnappers. In the court, Mason, attempts to get Drake, to mention the dentures himself during cross-examination, but does not push him on it. Later, Drake visits Mason, and determined to help, he gives him an official evidence envelope, so that he can present the dentures in court. However, the judge rules it inadmissible. He also doesn't allow the second autopsy of Gannon to be presented, stating that the body was not in proper chain of custody, and could have broken a hip on being stolen. Barnes, prepares Ennis for the stand, but was able to figure out, that he might be a weak link. Thus, 
he decides not to put him on the stand. While Holcomb, now knowing that he had something to do with the case, tells him, to make sure that no one can point a finger at him. Barnes, as his final witness, presents the guard from Emily's jail block, who falsely testifies, overhearing a confession between Emily and Sister Alice, when she visited her, and this causes chaos in the courtroom. As the court is adjourned for the day, Della, following the money, was able to figure out, payments being made to one of the church's old accountants. Mason, travels to the address, and finds a man named Jim Hicks. He tells Mason, that he has been waiting for him. He reveals to Mason, that he was a former accountant for the church, and as he was hesitant to participate in a financial fraud scheme, headed by church's deacon, Eric Seidel, he was let go of his position, and was given the land to buy his silence. Mason, presents Hicks's duplicate financial records, showing the church was $100,000 in debt. Later, Baggerly testifies, that he refused to provide another loan to the church, amounting to $100,000, just before Charlie's kidnapping, the same amount for which he was later ransomed for. Strickland, also returns from Colorado, and informs Mason, that Ennis and the two dead kidnappers worked as strikebreakers under Seidel, for a mining company in 1914, thereby proving their connection. Mason asks Strickland, to tail Seidel, in hopes of getting him to testify, but Seidel escapes, and goes to Ennis for help. Ennis, knowing that he is the only person who could point a finger at him, kills him. While Drake, was able to track the kidnapper's movements to a hotel, and he is informed by a maid, that Ennis showed up with a woman, to calm a crying child. Drake and Mason, visit the Chinatown brothel, where a girl tells Mason, that the woman Ennis took to the hotel, died of a heroin overdose. And as they go to the morgue, Virgil confirms to them, that being fed from a heroin-addicted woman would be deadly to a baby. Despite having all the answers, and knowing that Emily is innocent, they don't have actual evidence to provide in court. Meanwhile, Sister Alice, propagating a resurrection on Easter, is met with opposition from the other fractions of the church. And on Easter Sunday, Sister Alice goes with a hopeful Emily, to Charles' grave. Despite being requested by Della and Mason, not to do so. But it turns out to be a disaster, as Charlie's casket was empty, and people being agitated, started fighting. Mason, is able to get Emily to safety. On the other hand, as Sister Alice was returning with her mother, she finds a different baby on the streets, and she claims him to be Charlie. Alice, not being able to handle it, runs away from there. Mason, thinks of putting Ennis on the stand, hoping, that he will be able to break him up there. But Berger is not sure of his approach, and advises him to rest his case, and pin his hopes on Hicks' testimony. While Della suggests, that Mason puts Emily on the stand, and after contemplating, he decides to do so. But during her cross-examination, Barnes is able to get Emily, to claim partial responsibility for Charlie's death. Mason, delivers a passionate closing argument, blaming Barnes, for attacking Emily's character, instead of pursuing for the truth. As they waited for the jury to return, Mason finds out, that as he was late on paying taxes on his farm, it came up for auction, and Gibbs bought it. Knowing this Mason got quite worked up. The jury returned, after five days of deliberation, but they were not able to reach a decision, and remained deadlocked. Thereby, the judge declares it as a mistrial. Barnes, vows to retry the case, and attacks a reporter, who brings up the impact the failed trial will have on his campaign for mayor. While we see Strickland, meeting with a juror, whom he pays off. But he reveals to him, that there were two other jurors, who legitimately voted not guilty. Emily, despite knowing that the baby she got is not her son, accepts him as Charlie. While Alice's mother, not being able to find her, starts traveling with Emily preaching and claiming the child to be a miracle baby, in her newly formed Church of Reborn. Strickland, decides to leave Mason, and joins Berger, who will now be prosecuting the church's financial crimes. Holcomb and Ennis, are paid by Al Howard, the casino owner, but Holcomb, not trusting Ennis, gets him killed. While Drake, resigns from the police force, and joins Mason as an investigator. As he moves into Jonathan's office, with Della as his secretary, and future partner. Mason, vacates his farm, and decides not to fight Gibbs. He is also able to track down Alice. He tells her, that he knows that Charlie's death was not planned, and that he died because he was fed by a cocaine addict woman. While Gannon and Seidel, in order to cover the $100,000 hole, came up with a plan. And Ennis, working with his former friends, decided to do what was needed. 
but he was not able to figure out how Charlie's body disappeared from the casket, and he wanted to know from her if she was a fraud or a real believer. She doesn't provide him with a clear answer, but as they talk, they bond over their loneliness. As Alice leaves, she tells him that she was able to bring Charlie back. And as the season ends, we see Mason letting go of the black thread he took from Charlie's eye. Thanks for watching. And if you liked it, please subscribe.